racing up towards the furlough marker, and here comes Lester Bigger on Majinski. It's here on the far side, Lester Bigger on the near side of Majinski. Majinski coming and taking up from here, and racing up towards the line. It's a miss for Lester Bigger. Majinski's gone clear. Well, Academy, it's all Hello and welcome to the Sunday Sermon. My name is Lee Keys of SystemBetter.co.uk, and joining me tonight are my usual two cohorts, um, John Lane. Good evening, John. Right. Yeah, good evening, and good evening, Chris. Good evening. And special guest tonight, Stuart Williams, racehorse trainer. Good evening, Stuart. Good evening, Lee. Good evening. Right, we'll start the show off with a with a tribute to to Lester Piggott, who sadly passed away today. Um, big part of my uh, Growing up, and especially after his retirement, that's when I remember uh, when he came back after his retirement. I remembered him most. He's racing's big, big icon over the years, um, and everyone remembers his, his big classic successes and his nine Derby victories, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, what, what was astounding for me, though, and this this is it, uh, truly astonishing: 116 Royal Ascot winners um, with 11 Gold Cups, Ascot Gold Cups. That's incredible when you consider. The likes of and and by the way they've extended As- Royal Ascot now haven't they uh, as well in in modern times and you've got Frankie Dettori on seventy three Pat Edery on seventy three no one's ever going to break that record and it takes a special kind of man to do this and some of the rides in the past that I've been watching myself today um, obviously the, the the Breeders Cup emotional one on Royal Academy. Um, you know, days off his 55th birthday. That that played with the heartstrings of anyone that had a heart at that time. Then I keep watching the Rodrigo de Triano in 92 in the International, which for me, in modern, more modern terms, that's probably one of the best rides I think I've I've seen. I, to, to, win, to win an International, more or less w- without the horse knowing he'd had a race. I thought, tremendous jockey shit. Everything panicking, three out, and Leicester then comes through swinging away. He didn't panic. And he pressed the button as late as possible. It was, I, I urge anyone um, to watch that. The, the term legend is often thrown around very loosely these days in many sports. But I think most people in racing could agree that this is one hell of a genuine legend. And probably, in fact, I'm going to say he's the greatest jockey ever to sit on a racehorse. Lester Piggott, 5th of November, 1935 to 29th of May, 2022. Rest in peace. Chaps. I would like your favourite Leicester moments or anything you've got to say. John, I'm going to come to you first uh, to pay a tribute and and have some fun, even celebration about uh, Leicester Piggott. Well, I grew up in total law of Leicester Piggott. The build-up to the derby when I was a kid was always more intense than it is now. I think racing had wider appeal, all the, the industrial scale works and everywhere. Everybody used to talk about the derby. It really did stop the nation back then. Most of the build-up was what would Leicester ride. That, that was the extent to which he cast his shadow over the sport, really. He was one of the few sportsmen who was bigger than the sport itself, like Tiger Woods, Muhammad Ali, Don Bradman, Babe Ruth. He was in that bracket, if not at the top of it, when you look at the longevity of his career, you know. And I think all of us of a certain age who grew up with this absolute colossus dominating the sport, who feel a part of what made us as racing people has now gone. You yeah. know, he was 86, but it, it, it's just still very sad, you know? I mean, I was I was lucky enough to mix in circles that our paths crossed a few times, and I just remained all the time in complete awe of the man. Um, when I was quite involved with the Jeff Rag stable, he rode a filly in uh, a maiden at the Craven meeting that we didn't write much to. And she made a debut there. And she ran a pretty awful race. She was about 15 to 20. Lester in his particular style gets off and he muttered something like she not much and started <laughs> off in the lane realm. And uh, about three weeks later, uh, Jeffrey rang me up and he said, uh, Lester's been on the phone about that filly. He says, I should run her at Nottingham this week. 
we, we went through the race. We're going to take her out, actually, because there was four in there where we showed she couldn't bait. And I asked Jeffrey about this, and he rang Lester back, and he said, there's four in there, she can't bait Lester. And Lester just said, oh, they won't. Run. And sure enough, on the day, those four were missing. Now, we don't know to this day how we knew we might just <laughs> train them. Uh, try and get the ride on one of them. But anyway, as he comes into the paddock, he just said, oh, she'll win this. Pops off on this really hadn't shown us a, a lot, and she fair dotted up. He, he came, came in, gets off, muttered something that sounded like what he said the first time he'd ridden her, and gone. And <laughs> that that was him. <laughs> you know, yeah. Job done. No fuss, no nothing. And as I say, he'd seen, seen enough that first time when he'd had a fail up, he knew what she could do, and yeah, you know, and there'll be countless stories like that, won't there? Yeah, I mean, he's like such a character, and obviously on both sides of the coin, um, you know, lots of new market trainers that that, that rode for him that are around today. Gosden Stout uh, described him as an interesting character, to say the least. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> like you say, not always straightforward, but but yeah. Right. Stuart, anything that 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 you remember about Piggott? Well, I I obviously like to echo both yours and John's um, thoughts that he was an idol of mine. I grew up wanting to be Lester Piggott. I mean, I grew up in Newmarket and that was my ambition. I was going to be the next Lester Piggott sort of thing. And yeah, as I say, he was just head and shoulders above anyone else that was riding at the time. And there was some very, very good riders about then. And, you know, you were saying about Rodrigo Di Triano and a lot of people remember Lester for the, the rides on the Minstrel and Roberto and and the Royal Academy and the Breeders' Cup, yeah. where he was fairly vigorous with the whip. But 99 times out of 100, he was giving them rides like the one he gave Rodrigo de Triano yeah. in the International and the Guineas. And those horses, you know, you watch the races of Nijinsky when he won the Guineas and the Derby. He wouldn't have known he had a race. He hardly come off the bridle till the furlong pole. That, that and was- that... Yeah. You know, the, 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 to have the confidence to do that, and that's what Lester brought to the table. He had the confidence to know what he was riding and sit there and just wait and just put his horse in the race at the right time. No panic, as you said, you know, just smooth. And he was just, as I say, I, I, I've never seen anyone like him in the saddle, and I doubt we'll ever see anyone like him again. No, perfect points, perfectly made. Lester was brilliant. I mean, Sir Michael Stout was on Nick Look this morning, and um, it, great comments really from Stout. And he said, and he said Walter had rode Shergar and just basically won too far. You know, he rode him twice and won by double digits twice. And he said Lester, Lester won the Irish Derby, but the horse didn't have a race because he he didn't want to put the horse too much petrol, so to speak, than, than what was needed. That was it. He's just a fantastic judge and horseman. Uh, it, it was brilliant on them Rebo horses that uh, Mr Engel had, had in the late 60s as well, because a lot of them were absolute main bastards, and if you tried to throw the bit at them, they'd just spit it out a lot of the time, they wouldn't do a lot of <laughs> on the races. Yeah. And, and it, it, I think it was Ryan B. Roder, he won the ledger on when he beat Canterbury, and he won by a nose, and he never picked the whip up. No. He just cajoled the arse along and re- ridiculous skill, you know. Yeah, it's, it, it, I think I think it's what I mean. I I I admit I was a little bit tad <laughs> emotional this morning. Obviously, no no no, I didn't know Lester Pigger. I have met him once for a, for a photo, uh, you know, for selfie. But but I think when somebody this good goes, and then you start watching things and remembering, and it brings a lot of your childhood back, a lot of your teenage wild years etc and and uh, yeah just just really is it's just a, a sad moment chris anything you want to say about lester well uh, uh, to, to inject a, a much needed moment of levity i don't know if you remember from um, dave neverson's book uh, he had a, a rather nice lester anecdote for, for a short period of time i think like yourself lee um, neverson ran the winning line uh, <laughs> yes sipping service and they brought lester piggott on uh, signed him as a consultant, which was a 
you know, met with a great deal of fanfare. We got Leicester sort of tipping us the wink. We're going to get bundles here. And, uh, and he said throughout <laughs> the period of the relationship, you know, he didn't really hear much from Leicester. He said, but one day Leicester picked up the phone. And he said, oh, we've got a double maximum here for your clients. Three points win. Have your absolute bollocks on. This won't get beat. And it was a, a William Haggis horse, I think, from memory, at Yarmouth. And it's a six to four chance or something. So Neverson gets on the phone, records the message and said, right, clients, you know, Ray Granny's piggy bank, Ray the college fund. We've got a certainty here. Leicester's been on and this will not get beat. So, of course, all the clients pile, pile on and, um, you know, with, with a great deal of experience. Uh, so what they failed to um, uh, kind of note was that, that William Haggis had another horse in the race, which was quietly backed uh, and, and duly dotted up. Well, the, the even money favourite <laughs> that, uh, that advised all clients um, yeah. was, was tailed off. And Neverson said he always remembered Leicester's beaming face collecting collecting the trophy uh, in the winner's enclosure. And he sort of gave him a pull about it. And Leicester still didn't know anything about that one. Didn't even know he had another horse in the race. So that, that sort of um, encapsulate the other side of, of Leicester Pickett. But, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, he, he, loved, he loved the bet. Yes. Yeah. Good yeah, story. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, cracking story, yeah. Great, because a busy show we've got, so we're going to get on to um, some, <laughs> where do you start? Um, we're going to start with the the, the watering uh, policies of uh, uh. British race courses, which have certainly this week uh, caused much uh, anger, um, problems really for racing. Obviously, we lost Beverly um, due to the bend, Again, the, the common theme here. Uh, Haydock, because of the, the, the bend on, on Friday evening. And then um, we lost uh, Chester on Saturday. Uh, again, same reasons. And ironically, we our special guest on the show, Stuart Williams. Stuart, it was your horse. Yeah, thankfully, both the jockey and the horse are fine. So the horse yeah. has come back and he's eaten up and trotted up sound this morning. And Luke was fine as well. So... But um, obviously, yes, I agree. It's a it's a problem. Um, I think they've been caught out this year. We've had a very very dry spring. I would imagine the water table is very low. Yeah. So the so, so the ground underneath is very firm, and then they're watering the track to promote the grass growth and to make sure it's not fast fast ground. And obviously. You know, it's making it slippery on top. Um, you'd, you'd hope that going forward, we could find a way of working this out before a horse falls over or slips or because there's going to be an accident at some stage. Yeah, if a bad one. Yeah. Having falls on the flat without there being an accident. The horses are going plenty fast enough. And, um, you know, I think they um, they need to get on top of this fairly sharpish. I mean, I mean, it was you, your, your very self, that pointed me onto a video, which I, I'd actually never seen. I do like to watch a lot of these, uh, you know, uh, uh, preview shows on at the races that have done like interview jockeys and trainers, and it, it's it's fantastic for listeners if you haven't uh, watched this. It's Sir Mark Prescott, King for a Day. Uh, if you just go, just put that into YouTube, King for a Day, Sir Mark Prescott, you will you will get Sir Mark John McCreary talking with Samar Prescott and he educated just watching that video was an education for me because I have absolutely no clue on um on 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 how to how to maintain lawns etc etc apart from sticking water on to make the grass grow and then cut it uh, but Samar Prescott explains it in fantastic terms where you begin to uh, the fatal error was was back in the day where the BHA said that had changed their stance on watering basically where they'd gone from you 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 can w- uh, water only for safe ground but but now they, they changed it to, to sort of good to fit you must get water to get good to firm you can't Just race on grass growth, wasn't it? yeah to promote yeah yeah and 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 obviously then the the different kind of grass set in and it cuts up like Stuart's just said you've got firm ground underneath and then the the top cuts up and cut and, and and comes off, and then you need to keep obviously watering to keep the grass growing, and then this is where you've got this where where to be fair on bastards we have covered this and we've said we we believe that it has to be more dangerous for a racehorse racing on on uh, ground like that because 
I, I think for slipping injuries, pulling muscles, you know, that's the kind of muscle where if you slip, you know, you, you're going to pull tendons, etc. I, 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 Stuart, are you are you are you in agreement? That, I that, am in totally agreement. Yeah, and and the thing is, see that you know, I would urge your listeners to watch the the King for a Day thing with uh, Samar because, <laughs> like I said, that that sets out what has actually happened over the last 25, 30 years. It was pre the BHA. It was the Jockey Club at the time. That yeah. made the that made the change from from promoting grass growth to actually changing the, the description of the going. But when I'm looking at a race, the the most important thing from my point of view as, as to whether my horse can win that race is if it's going to act on the track, on the going, yeah. you know, on the on the ground. Yeah. And if it doesn't act on the ground, it ain't winning that race. That's full stop. And I think. You know, personally, I, I think that the clerk of the course has got an almost impossible job now. Again, because of the things that Sir Mark said in that, that they've changed the way they they run more often than tracks now than they used to. So that so they're having to put in fast growing grass, which then sits on the top instead of going really deep. And then we water it and it gets loose on top. And there's so many times I go to the races and the horse doesn't handle the track because it's loose on top and just is unsure about where it's putting his feet. Personally, I'd like to see from, from, from our side, from the trainers and the horse people's side and from the punter's side, I think one of the things that we could do to make it better would be to have an independent BHA person who goes round and checks the ground not for safety concerns, but for actually the description of the ground on the day. Yeah. He's got carte blanche to go in there and say, I don't agree with the ground description. I think it's this. You know, they'd have to do it. Maybe they could do it the day before, hopefully. But something along those lines. And I think the punters groups and the BHA punters forum and stuff like that would be far better off trying to get something like that in place. So when you had a bet or we had a runner, we've got an accurate description of what the going is going to be like as best as possible. Yeah. I mean, I mean the clerk of the courses have got a vested interest. They've got pressure from their superiors at the tracks, the owners of the tracks to get as many horses as possible there. Well, and, it's, it's often funny, isn't it? When, when, when a track has a, has a potential <coughs> star, star running at their meeting, it's, it's often, you know, and it needs sort of good, good to soft, no, no quicker than good. It's yeah. always good. <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, when, it's what John Gosden wants, though, isn't it? That's, well, that's yeah. what it's like. <laughs> when you 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 uh, discussed it a few weeks ago, um, I had one uh, that was due to run on the Sunday of the Greenham meeting. Yeah, and um, I know the clerk of the course well at Newbury, and the the going on the Friday when I had to on the, well, the Thursday before they declared for Saturday, the going you described as with the going stick would be on the soft side of good yeah and he said watering to maintain yes so the horse i've got in on sunday wants fast ground it's going to be blazing sunshine for the next two days and i'm thinking lovely it'll be fast by sunday yep but then it says watering to maintain good and it was on the slow side of good yeah so i rang him up and had the conversation you know what's the ground going to be like on sunday is it going to be good to firm by then? Because I'd like to run this horse. And he said, under no circumstances is the ground going to be good to firm. On well, that, that, that's a damning statement there. You've heard it first here on Bastards. That is a damning statement because th there's what? no ab absolutely no reason why we cannot have good to firm ground chaps. Is there anything wrong with good to firm these days? I mean, firm is now consigned to the history bin. Yeah. It's finished. No more firm. If, you, if your horse likes firm, I mean, you'll get it at Bath. You have to keep running yeah. at Bath. But, but um... which is the thing, Lee. I mean, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. They have absolute zero stats to prove that good to firm ground injures any horses because they don't make any difference whether it's good to firm natural or good to firm watered. No, it, it, it's true. That, that that's the thing. I mean, and I know this is this is digressing, but on similar lines, when you hear racing pundits say, "Oh, this horse has got really warm. It's sweating, sweating between yeah. the back legs. It's sweating down the neck. Um, it's not a good sign." This. 
Well, it's interesting because no one's actually ever done a study on it apart from Jeffrey Hudson, uh, an Australian paddock judge that analysed over 10,000 beasts and actually sweating was a positive. Uh, actually made money. If you backed every sweater, by his prob- it's probably all milkshaking over there. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> anyway, that's another story. But, but anyway, the study was, it was about 12% return on investment back in sweaters. And when you think about it, you sweat to cool down. Some some horses enjoy sweating because it cools them down. You know, it's not, I, I don't get this lazy punditry. And it's the same with ground, coming back to ground where we are. John's right in that there is absolutely no data Available. You, get, you get sick of listening to commentators and pundits saying it's good safe ground, you know, they've done a wonderful job. You know, what the blue hell is wrong with good to firm ground naturally produced? Nothing like Stuart says, but, but so that's quite quite a revelation because we've thought for a while now they're actually and Andrew Cooper for me is one of the biggest <coughs> biggest culprits for it. And you can guarantee and we've got a big meeting coming up this, this week, obviously, Oaks and Derby. And you can guarantee Andrew Cooper will turn the bloody taps on whatever and he'll make sure that the ground will be possibly good. No, no, Because obviously for the Derby, he wants it, you know, quicker than good. So Oaks Day is always going to be that well, little I, bit more juice in it. This is well, it. I, I mean, hope so. I bet that's well. So I hope you don't <laughs> yeah, but I mean, how, how, how now, quick then. do you need have your brains taken out to back an exit and excel for the Oaks now and in post? Well, there this is it. This is it. It's, it's, a, it's a very strange uh, situation we find ourselves in. And, and obviously, going forwards, solution-wise, I mean, I, I come with something very radical on the on on the on the Twitter feed. Where I'm sorry, but if they don't do anything about this and they carry on doing what they're doing, they don't change anything. You're going to have to do a font well and sand the bends because that's where all the problems is. Not in the straights, obviously. If an horse runs in a straight line, it shouldn't really be slipping. But obviously, round round tight bends, well, it's going to slip, uh, and and that's the thing. So, and as ins- and insurance, uh, Stuart, how does jockeys' insurance work work out these days? Well, I think they've got their own um, insurance that's done through the PJA, so they're all they're all insured. Um, they get that. They have to pay for it. So the PJA pay for it, and then the jockeys pay for it through subscriptions. Yeah. But, um, but like I said, it, it, we need to be identifying the slippery bends before someone gets hurt, not after someone's fallen over and then exactly. Going, you know, once racing started, it's too late. Yeah, that's it. And then and then it's a tragedy. You get like a a situation where a jockey's like you know seriously injured in hospital, possibly you know you've seen like we injuries over jumps, etc. You know what can happen. And the thing is, when you're travelling at these speeds around tight tracks and tight bends, you know all all you need is 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 to fall in the wrong direction, in the wrong path of 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 something else, and uh, it's a, it's horrific. What well, what what on 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 Saturday, my horse was at the rear. But yeah. actually, he'd have been in front. Absolutely. You know, he could have still come down if he was in front. Stuart, and he... And he, he, he Good job, you've, kept, you've dropped him in trips since you got him, Stuart. <laughs> Stuart. Yeah, uh, it was a bit <laughs> fortunate, actually, because he's quite a nervy sort of horse anyway, so it was not the ideal thing for him. He's um, quite high metal and very, very keen. Yeah, uh, Stuart, Stuart ring, the, ring, ring the handicap and tell him you still want your three pounds off. Yeah, yeah. So, so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, it's, I'm not it's sure no good not to, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's a wasted trip. It was. Anyway, so solutions wise, like Stuart says, there needs to be something in place. I'm, I'm sure they can get their heads together on this one. How far down the rabbit hole do you think we ask you? Do you think these oh. chaps are all assholes now? Well, what? Well, I, like I said, I think they've got. A, I think the clerk of the course has got a very, very difficult job because they're they're trying to do two things. They're trying to produce ground that's good for the horses to race on and safe, but they're also trying to attract runners. Now, the uh, Richard Aldous from Yarmouth rings me about three times a year and says, "Oh, it's ever so quick. I, I don't know about putting water on and everything." And I say to him, "I said, look, Richard, it's Yarmouth. It's a sand-based track." No one's entering their soft ground horses there. You know, we know it's going to be fast ground. Yeah. As long as it's safe, you know, leave it alone. It's going to be fast ground. We enter the fast ground horses there. You know, no one's got a problem with turning up. If they tell you, we've had no rain for six weeks, we've done our best, we've put water on to grow the grass, but the ground's going to be quick, but we don't think it's going to be any damage in it. Just don't send your soft ground horses. I don't think anyone's got a problem with that. Yeah. 
it the problem comes when like like you said that occasionally i think they're watering to attract runners and then you get there and it's described as good to firm there's a shower an hour before the race they run they run the first race and all the jockeys come back in and say it's soft yeah we've had, we've, we've, had, we've had going changes after the first race with no with no change in the weather that's how bad you know the, 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 it's got softer with no rain <laughs> <laughs> How does that work? Um, but this is what we use the turf track archive for. Stuart, if you ever get tip-offs from the Yarmouth clerk of the course, ask him if it's been windy and it's blown the water and there's a stand rail bias. We all love yeah, a stand yeah, rail I, Yarmouth bias. I think Shoot. that happens a, quite a lot. Yeah, yeah. quite a lot at Yarmouth. But yeah. the, other, the other thing is, see, I, see, going back to what Sir Mark said in the, um, in the videos, it's like new markets changed measurably over the years now. I think John Doe will t- uh, back me up on this, that it used to be almost impossible to make the run in at Newmarket and win. Yeah. It was a hold-up track. Mm. Now it's the other way around. You've got to be on the front end at Newmarket. Unless there's a headwind, you need something that's on the front end and tracking because yeah. it's got so undulating now that the, the horses behind can't make the ground up. Yeah. It's, it, it's, you know, all, it's just all ridges. The dynamic yeah. of, a lot of these tracks have just changed completely. And then you get, like you say, I'm sure you know, I, I, I make a point of I always make my apprentices walk the track. You'll always see Marco walking the walking the track before racing. And I try and walk the tracks as much as I can myself. And definitely with the watering, you you get strips of parts of the course that are quicker than others. Yeah. And I don't think anyone's done it on purpose. That's just how it is, because it hasn't naturally rained on all of it. It just the water's migrated to one part or another for whatever reason. The booms are a much better watering system than the, the drag along pipes that they used to use, but it still happens occasionally. And, yeah. you know, and then you'll get one that will go and win by four or five lengths and look amazing and do a fantastic time. And you think, wow, that's a bloody next coming, that one. That's, a, you know, thinking about Biznari at Newmarket or something like that. And everyone's over the moon and it's going to be a next coming and next time out it gets lapped sort of thing you know and you think well you're scratching your head think well how does that happen yeah and i'm sure that they get on sometimes it might not be the whole track but it might be two or three furlongs of the track where it's got on a faster strip it wouldn't necessarily need to be on the rail even yeah but i definitely think that happens yeah 100 percent. i mean i mean i've I've had pictures sent before uh, uh, of, of like Carlisle, for example. It gets very windy up there, and um, I've, I've, had, I've had pictures sent to me when when they, when they water, and you can see the literally when it's windy that the water's going sideways. It's, it's not, you know, yeah. and and uh, you know, the, the the maintenance guy, whoever's driving the tractor around or whatever, pulling it, he, he's not bothered. He's just he's getting paid his his money. He's not bothered that it's it's happened to be. You know, hence why you get major biases at Carlisle. Some, yeah. Sometimes you can come stands rail and it's like at 10 lengths quicker. Sometimes it's the other way around. It probably depends which way the wind's blown yeah. um, when they've watered. So that's something for form book students. Start studying when when they've been watering. And there's been I'll, strong winds across the tracks. You, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, I can I, I can say this because it's uh, Folkestone, but when, when Folkestone was up, and I, it wasn't long after I started training, I had a decent old sprinter called Batman Again. Yeah. And he'd gone down in the, the handicap a bit. He, 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 we had him until he was quite aged, and he was quite a good horse when he was young, and he was still capable of winning occasionally, but wasn't as good when he got older. I went down to Folkestone, and um, so I had to walk the track. And we were drawn, so I think we were drawn 10 of 10 or something like that, which was away from the away from the rail when you usually want to be on the stand side rail at Folkestone. It was a thing where you just, you're better off on the stand rail on the sprint track. And um, anyway, I've gone down there and walked the track. And it's like, looking hard on the far side, right, proper good to firm on the far side. And I'm getting the stick in on the near side. Yeah. So I go back in and I speak to the clerk of the course and said, we were in the first race. I speak to the clerk of the course and said, there's a bit of a difference in the in the track. He said, oh, yeah. He said uh, they had the pull along um, watering system. He said, yeah. He said, we, we couldn't get the watering system across to the other side. So we only watered the, the near side. <laughs> <there."> <laughs> so, 
So I've got, <laughs> I, I think I had Michael Tebbit riding him or something like that. I got hold of him by the scruff of the neck in the paddock <laughs> and said, right, far side, don't take any notice, just go far side. He went far side on his own. He won by about three lengths. <laughs> <laughs> it's just amazing. It's just, See, it's, I, love it. I love it when trainers like this are switched on. You know, this is it. You've got to be switched on in this game. You need every edge you can find. And, and Stuart's are highlighting there where you can get edges um, on a certain day. Fantastic story. Right, so we, so we move on to rip off tracks and Chester. Um put out an interesting tweet on Saturday after abandoning the meeting, of course, at the fault of of their own. They said, uh, you know, it it was like written by the BHA, John. Um, You know, that kind of like cold, you know, uh, sort of like... uh, Basically, they just absolved themselves of all blame, didn't they? It was... Astonishing. The BHA stewards decided it wasn't safe. We reluctantly agreed with them. The meeting's been abandoned, and it's good luck getting it if you want a refund because you're not. I mean, I mean so, sorry, Chris. But, you know, it's just saying it's very bureaucratic language. You, you sort of know what they wanted to say, but <coughs> whoever drafted that has no kind of sense of, 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 of how to phrase that kind of stuff. It was dismissive, it was offhand, and you read that again and you cringe because it's just dreadful, but really, really bad. Yeah, he, he was an, it was awful. Uh, you know, it got. You see, I, I like how they put the track crest at the top, and as if yeah. it, as if they're telling people, no, well, you're not entitled because these are our terms and conditions. Like a government edict. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, it was. Yeah, he's <laughs> got the HM Treasury, and it's like a, a press release, a very formal, almost a civil service type announcement, and and you think that, you know, that, that, that anyone with even a, a basic command of English could have toned that down and, and made it more conciliatory. But even by saying the same thing, it could have been in a much softer, more friendly way. But but anyone reading that or going round racing for the first time would have... Would, would, would have been softer and more friendly if they put a podium up and got pretty Patel to read it out, wouldn't it? <laughs> But, but perhaps not. <laughs> but, 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 this is, I mean, it's £50 for tats at Chester yeah. on the Saturday, well, which is fairly minty. Um, you know, for, for a, let's let's look at the Chester card. It, it, it wasn't, it, you know, it, it, what, the, the feature race was okay, etc. But but it wasn't particularly top-class racing no. for £50. A disappointing, and I hope Chester recon, reconsider that and apologise and maybe offer at least a, 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 a free tickets maybe oh. for, for, for future meetings or something for the patrons. Yeah. I think I think also when people in the in the current economic climate are sort of struggling to sort of put food on the table, heat their houses, you know, leisure spending is under pressure. And so, you know, all leisure industries have to do their absolute best to try and, you know, attract and retain customers. I wonder how many people who went there for the first time on Saturday, having, you know, done 50 quid in cold blood or whatever, plus food, drink, betting money would be minded to come back after that. I, I think very few. Because, uh, you know, you'd be better off setting fire to it, wouldn't you? Uh, I just think that's really, really dumb of, of Chester to break in that way. It, yeah, it, It's short-sighted, but yeah. if they're going to fill it at £50 a pop, you've got more chance of getting it with the Queen's knickers than them dropping the price. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Yeah, he, even John Egan, uh, old man John, got in on the debate, and he said he's never seen racing as much trouble. And um, Chester somehow... Like a few other tracks, uh, I may add, failed to read the room. And and this is, do you know, I, I'm worried about racing, especially tracks, because they're all going cashless, and I've no idea why. I, York's no cash machines. Leicester have in, in introduced this bizarre scheme of when you get into Leicester, um, you have to buy vouchers. Got their own currency. And then... And, and then, and then cash the vouchers in, and then the, if there's anything left on them, the, what on earth is this nonsense? Well, they're on exchange rate next. I, yeah. I'm going to say, yeah, I mean, it's just absolutely bonkers which which yeah. which, which way racing's going here. Because let, let's let's be fair, the, the tracks need the punters, and I, I don't I don't think necessarily think that um, this is the way to go about things. But there, we are where we are. Moving on to the betting and betting ring. Um, well, we, we know what we've currently been debating a long time, which is the gambling uh, review 
um, which is imminent. Um, and I've got some information which is pretty exclusive, really. No one's got this information. I, I've asked my snouts in Westminster. Um, the publication is going to be out in June. I am reliably, reliably told affordability checks will be in the background and will target young and vulnerable with unobtrusive checks like TransUnion uh, checking the, your credit rating. An ombudsman is still being looked at. I'm told that uh, Premier League sponsorship is definitely being targeted and that probably will be uh, banned as well as probably advertising in grounds for, for, for gambling. Racing is seen as fairly harmless in terms of people that suffer gambling with harm and reportedly the government want to protect that to protect the racing industry. However, I've got my doubts because the seedy, dirty bookmakers, we've seen how they've abused their authority let's see given to them by the gambling commission or, or told what they've got to do by the gambling commission they haven't just tried to weed out problem gamblers they've been trying to get rid of established gamblers that not necessarily are winners either i've, I've lo- had lots of stories in the past year lot and, and this is affecting liquidity on the exchanges it's also affecting uh punters ability to get their bets on and many punters now are betting in what's that groups with bookies from spain i do i bet with a bookie from spain there you go i've told you this is what happens you have to be able to get your money on and if you can't get your money on then what can you do um and and the the one mp that i know john doesn't like philip davis john you you're you're not a fan not especially no no at least he keeps estimates way out of mischief. <laughs> but he, 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 he argues that if we do have an ombudsman, it has to be on the side of punters. So far, we've got the useless gambling commission in charge of all this, that all they're interested in is money laundering and gambling harm. We need an ombudsman that's on the side of punters. You hear some horror stories. Punters that have had bets won. The bookies won't pay until they produce um, Catherine Fry's knickers, you know, on the top of a flagpole on Ben Nevis. You know, it's 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 literally like that. It's terrible to get paid. It's not on. Uh, and this is where I think we need balance back into the game. And I mean, Stuart, I'll I'll come to you on this because obviously you're you're responsible for one of the biggest gambles in UK racing. Um, with Exponential and the legendary Patrick Beach. That can't be done now, can it? No, no, that, 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 you know, that, that, that just can't be done. And it's, I, I, I personally, I think that we, we don't look after the, so the two main income streams that racing it has are the owners and the punters. Yes. Pretty much not many other people put money in. No. The sponsors do, but it comes from the punters. It's mostly bookmakers, but those are the two biggest groups that put in. Everyone else is kind of taken out. And I don't think we look after either of them very well. I think they need to go back to a, a turnover base rather than a gross profits. Um, James Knight was tweeting the other day about the a, a lose limit in, um, in Australia and New Zealand. So you yeah. could bet to lose a certain amount without being restricted. To win a certain amount, sorry, not to lose, to win a certain amount without being restricted. And James Knight was saying that that people are, have got that to bet on the English racing, but not their English customers. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I mean, you even so even yeah, we're just not looking after. We're not looking after the the punters like like you just said about Chester. You know, that's a terrible way to look after your customers. Those people at the track on Saturday didn't get what they paid for. No. Now, if you don't get what you paid for and you're a customer, surely you're entitled to something. You know, not a curt notice that read, like you said, like a government statement. You know, you want them people to come back. There are there are people that are paying for the industry, you know, helping to pay for the industry, our punters. And then we're not looking after the punters very, very well. We Any, any gambler that looks like winning, they close them down. Um, they only want the losers. Like I said, they, I, at Chester... They look after the owners brilliantly, but not all of the tracks are like that. York look after them brilliantly as well. And, they, and to be fair, they have got better. But you know, what would you used to be an owner, Lee? What would yeah. what would tempt you back into ownership again? Being um, after better at the track, more prize money, you know, I, I, I more think transparency. It's, 
Yeah, I, I think I think it's just the the, the chance really to you, you do the maths and. I was heavily involved in horse ownership from 2011 to about 2015. And I I lost probably in the region of, I don't know, I'd, not counting the betting, but I, definitely in like terms of prize money and training spent, probably somewhere in between 150 and 200,000 <coughs> was lost on, on training fees. Now, that's a very difficult game for somebody like me that's not at the top of the betting tree, you know, to, to maintain. So, so obviously I had to, cut my cloth accordingly and, and, and sort of, you know, uh, abandon ship. And I found out it's really difficult with the prize money because you, 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 you know, there's that people don't forget as well. You have to pay the VAT on, 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 on prize money, you know? So, so it's, it's, it's not like you just get the, the prize money. There's, there's VAT to come off that as well. I found the whole experience, including recently, really, uh, when I've just had the odd share in things and I've owned a little small filly that, that I've got, you get BHA fees that you just think, why am I paying this? Why, why do I have to pay this fee to, for, for my trainer, Grant Chua to, to, to act why every year why do i have to re-register my colors every year uh, and pay that fee and, and it's all take 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 and I, I can remember forgetting about one fee recently and i got so i, I it was only a small fee from that i can't remember what it was it was 40 quid that's all it was so the bha wrote me a letter you have not paid your 40 quid blah 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 uh it is now 90 quid it's a 50 pound charge it's like just give it a rest. I mean, so I paid the ninety pound. I've I've just I've just been totally pissed off by the game. I think a lot of people are in in your position, and you yeah. know we need to be we need to be doing something, you know, something radical, that, you know, something drastic. Not that you know we were arguing the trainers were arguing with Ark about putting another extra race on, uh, and they were going to put um, so they're going to have a minimum eight race cards. Yeah. yeah through the winter and they were going to put another five million in yeah we had gay on talking that about kind that. of stuff five million is it's rearranging the deck chairs on the titanic yeah so absolutely. In, the, in the grand scheme of things we need you know enterprise money we need 50 to 100 million to make it so as we can you know if i win a small race you know the lowest grade race if i win a small race my percentage for as a trainer for winning that race is about 185 pounds yeah and the jockeys is less it's just ridiculous you know and like i said the owners you 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 win two or three races and pay for two months training fees but do you think we're winning two or three races and paying for the whole year there's no will at the top Stuart, to be radical is there i mean you you just get ceo after ceo that's just crossing towards the enhanced pension but, yeah, but do you think? But do you think that kind of climate, Stuart, encourages not not asking you to be specific, encourages or creates an environment where people are tempted to enter into corrupt practices? Well, look, I, you know, you know if, there's, if, if there's money to be made, obviously yeah. that that's the risk. Yeah. You know, if there's money to be made, yeah. You know, that's the that's a there'd be far less of a I think would be far less of a an issue. If, for argument's sake, the prize money for each race was ten grand, yeah, then you have to think carefully before any of that sort sort of entered yeah. the yeah, yeah. no sphere that's, sort of that's thing. Good, that's, it, good, that's a good point. Good point. When it's like my like my percentage under an eighty quid, who cares sort of thing whether it wins or loses, other than you feel good when you've had a winner. Yeah, sure. You, know, you want the horse to win because you worked hard with it at home and stuff like that but then yeah. in the grand scheme of things it doesn't actually make any difference no it makes you and the owner and the lad who looks after it feel good on the day yeah but Stuart, but, Stuart, Stuart have you been approached by arc are he, have you heard rumors about this behind closed doors i uh, i haven't but i'm probably not on um or not on their christmas card list particularly <laughs> because uh, when the last time we had the the boycott uh, about three years ago. Rafe Beckett, I'm not, I'm, I was involved in the Trainers Federation. I'm still a member, but I'm not involved in any of the committees and stuff now. But Rafe Beckett, Beckett asked me to come down to the, the BHA meeting with him yeah. when we were arguing about prize money at that stage. So uh, I'm probably not on their Christmas card list because we were quite disparaging about them <laughs> but they you know i it's another thing so a lot of their tracks will be not wanting customers 
at the tracks because no. they made more money during lockdown. You know, yeah. the, me- the media rights money. The media rights, from, that's where they make their money, from the everyday media. I mean, what, what, uh, the thing is, for me, with ARC, they, they seem to be taking the, or trying to take the horse racing down the route of, um, of ground racing, where I think they'd be more than happy to start racing at, at sort of 10 a.m. in the morning and finish at 8.30 at night every every day, barring probably Christmas Day. That, that's that, that's generally the feel I get from ARC, um, the direction they want to take it. Um, you know, full of full of 0-60s, 0-55s. Um, do you know, Stuart, do you know the criteria for courses, what they have to put on in terms of... No, well, like, this, is, this is one of the problems, is that the when they OFT ruled against what was then the BHB and Peter Savile um, and ruled in favour of the race courses. Um, the race courses now own the fixtures themselves. Yeah. And within, I don't actually know the parameters of what races they can put on. I think, I think the BHA can decide what distance races they put on but not what actual the conditions of the race is. They, they have very little say. And the, the way they get tempted to put some races on that they wouldn't necessarily need to put on is by the levy board ta- dangling the carrot of, well, we'll put the money up if you put this race on. So, th- so that's, where, that's where that comes from. But you're right in that the 2015, they had um, industry road shows traveling around the country run by the BHA with Nick Rust. And he stood up and said that they wanted another 2,000 horses in training by 2020 because they wanted to grow the product. Yeah. Well, all the all the good horses are being bred already. So if you're growing the pool of horses, yeah. you, you can't breed from the top ones. They're being bred already. So you've got to breed from the lesser ones. So now we're in... We, we, we're now seeing the fruit of, of that, that the bookmakers, the race courses and the BHA wanted more racing mm. and they wanted more horses to fill the fixture program. And that's where we are now. So we're now in a state where the, the, the prize money spread so thin, the owners are leaving. There's not as many horses in training as there was. A lot of the, a lot of the top horses are being sold abroad. Now, horses always got sold abroad, and, and Lee Modder said did a thing on, oh, there's not any more horses being sold abroad now than there was. But it wasn't the top horses. It was the under 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 the top being sold abroad. Yeah, now, the- we're selling a lot of the top horses abroad. Um, so when you get up past 85, there's so few horses mm-hmm. in different people's hands, and they don't want to run against themselves, that you end up with small fields. So the only big fields you get are the 55, the 60s, the 65s. They're always full. <clears throat> Ark think, well, let's put some of them on because we fill them and they're good for the levy because we get betting on those races. And it's like a vicious circle. We're going further, further down that road of a race every five minutes just to fill that media rights program so the bookmakers pay them the money. But it's actually turning the punters off and the owners as well like i said it's a serious problem it is a, a big corp i mean yeah. i mean i mean this this is this is this is who is causing this problem the answer to shareholders and 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 this literally is they're doing that they, they are they are wanting wall-to-wall racing that the, they don't and i think that's the problem that i've got at the moment right we, we all we've all got different reasons for being in racing um stuart you're a trainer um, so you want what's best for your owners and your horses. Uh, I'm a punter, so I want what's best for me. You've got breeders that want what's best for them. You've got bookmakers and corps that want what's best for them, tracks that want what's best for them. But no one wants to sit round a table and say what's best for the sport. Well, that that's the problem, is that what we really need, what we really need is a Barry Hearn-type character to get hold of it and say, right, this is the direction we're going in. Yeah. 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 There's so many fractional interests who are very very influential in one way or another and you know 
uh, under the structure, I, I, I do feel for the BHA in that way, that under the structure they're under at the moment, they've got very little power to do anything. They walk into disaster, aren't they, by, by just a lack of leadership and, and as you say, a, a lack of a, not necessarily a charismatic figure, but somebody with enough sort of heft to, to bang heads together and say, right, this is the vision, this is what we're all going to do, you're all going to agree with it and, you know, be damned we're going to move forward in this way at the minute it's sort of you know two steps forward one and a half back then somebody resigns after a couple of years or is replaced and, it, and it's sort of the same old same old so I yeah that, that that is a problem is that the 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 structure of all these boards and the the they've all got ceos and chief execs and stuff like that and they're there to do a job and they're there for a number of years and then they go yeah they're not so, so there was a lot of things wrong with the old jockey club. Yes. But at least they had racing's interests at heart. Yes. They were racing people who had racing's interests at heart. Yes. And the, the they corporate were, they were, side of it now dictates yeah. that, that that they're there to make money for their whichever group they're on, whether yeah. it's the race courses or the or the corporate side of the entertainments and stuff like that sort of thing. They're there to make um, money. For their bit that they're in right now, yeah, and they're not looking at the long term. It, it, it's interesting about the jockey club, though. It, you know, perversely, you, you are absolutely right. Perversely, the jockey club, for their many faults, had in racing's interest absolute the core of them because many of the members of the jockey club were so stratospherically rich they weren't actually concerned with commercial considerations about the profit and loss which actually worked in racing's favor for, for, for a long long time but but as you try and kind of democratize it you know the the, the, the unexpected uh, consequences of that is you've got sort of careerists and professional ceos who are there to try and you know balance the books etc but the effect of that is it, it's actually sending you know racing down the wrong path so so I agree entirely with all of that. Yeah, it's, I mean, racing really has got problems. If I was, if I was actually head of the BHA, I would just plainly come out and say we're fucked. Uh, because I think if you actually say that and you don't run around this pretense that we're not, um, you'd probably get help. You probably get, so you know, you get certain people listening. Maybe, yeah. maybe because we know how important the race industry is a to the government treasury to all all people that are employed within it. So yeah. you. you by, by just carrying on and just saying and accepting the status quo or just carrying on and just saying, well, what can we do? You know, just just come out and make a statement. So well, I've just took this job on Julia Harrington. Um, yeah, we're completely fucked. Yeah. Rip the band <laughs> take off straight away. Rip the yeah. band. Say, Look, we are hemorrhaging money and we're hemorrhaging, uh, you know, uh, followers of the sport. Please, government, help us. You know, yeah. This is in it where they're saying, well, we're, we're sort of in a bit of a pickle. You know, can you do something? Well, you know, it's not that bad. So we'll kick that, you know, kick the can down the road for another year and it's getting progressively worse. So I, I agree with that as well. Tough times. John Egan spotted it. The jockey. I like that tweet from John Egan. I mentioned it earlier in the show. Uh, definitely racing. I'd like to be more positive, but the, there's not really every decision made seems to be against the sport for me. You know, forget forget what I want, forget what Stuart wants, forget what breeders anyone anybody wants. It should be it should be done for the best of the sport, and and like Stuart says, maybe a Barry Hearn type to come in and. Let's have Don King out of retirement. Yeah, Don. Don. <laughs> he'll, rip, he'll rip everybody off, but at least you know where you are with it. Right? <laughs> Don everybody Lee, you know, it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, right, no, another subject that's uh, certainly got my attention as a punter is the stewards. And we noticed a big change in stewarding uh, on stewards' inquiries last summer when we found some strange results are uh, getting turned around and we thought what's suddenly gone off here um the bha never said anything they never said anything to punters they don't care about punters they didn't say oh by the way we're gonna we're suddenly just gonna change our stewarding methods uh to make sure you can't just put one over a rail and 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 and, and win the race um so i get i get i get the argument i get but they could have told punters in advance that they were they, they were changing and made it very public that be careful at taking 101 on the exchanges in running uh when you've won half a length because we're still going to chuck you out um now if it's so, any consolation they didn't tell us either no no well, well this is it i mean this is the bha fee you know let, let's have a word with our stewards on on the direction we're going to take in terms of uh disqualifications but don't tell anyone 
Um, sums it up really doesn't it um well three horses yesterday got disqualified one was one was a gimme um i thought the one at cartmel was a gimme there was another one at chelmsford which under the old rules would probably not have gone because um it it's classed as sort of you know sort of take t- uh, intimidation if you like intimidation didn't used to get get done very much um but I, I get reason why they took that out but the most ridiculous one of the day and i challenge anyone to watch it is the eight o'clock at foss last that takes some doing you know by any any stretch of the imagination the horses won three quarters of a length they've been hammer and tongs there was a bit of bumping yeah you know you could say the other ones bumped it a little bit blah de, blah but three quarters of a length at the line they chucked it Stuart, did you see that no, I, I, to be honest, I don't watch jump racing. No, it's terrible. I don't blame you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, I don't watch jump racing, and 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 I, and I can't I can't comment on jump racing because I've never been in, I've never been involved in it. Um, but I do I do think like I, I watched I was at Chelmsford and I saw the Chelmsford one, and it it was I, I think you're correct that that two or three years ago that would not have been thrown out. No. Um, but I'm. <laughs> I kind of think the balance had gone too far yes. in the favour of the aggressors before, and they they've tried to bring it back. But why why not tell us they were doing that? I think they, you know, I think they should have told us. Look, we're gonna we're gonna start saying if you haven't tried to keep straight, you've got a fair chance of going. Whereas before, if you knocked one over, unless it was a head or a short head, the nose, you'd had no chance of getting thrown out. Yeah, we we look we're getting horses disqualified now for half a length next. I don't you know. want to go shy about telling people either because I think overall, I think people would have welcomed it like heroes. Yeah, I, I do I do agree with everything that said that that in the past you could literally you you, you know if one was making ground up you're in in a rail as long as you chopped it off. Um, you know, and and sort of even if it come back and got beat half a length because it was half a length. It wouldn't get the race because it was too far. You had to literally get beat a nose or a short head for something really bad. I can't. Get... I can't remember its name now. But the grey one of Hannon's that Richard Hughes rode, and it went and the, in the um, at, on the July course and in the Group One, and it went Snow Lantern. Sorry? Snow Lantern. Snow Lantern. Yeah. It took it from one side of the track to the other, and beat it ahead or whatever it was. Yeah. And and didn't get thrown out. They appealed and got didn't get it in the in the appeal either. I mean that was just ridiculous. That should that would have won two lengths, I should think. If it, it took it took it from one side of the track to the other. Yeah. Per- personally, personally, Stuart, and, and I've said this from the start. I'd be in favour of um, like doing away with 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 stewarding as we know it, and having having professionals um, professional stewarding in terms of like knowledge. And I do believe we've got a lot of idiots that are well, making they, these decisions. They pretty much are professional stewards now. So there's only one. Um, non-professional steward would be on the panel now. There would be two professionals and one non-professional at each yeah. meeting making the decisions now. That's fair so enough. It would be two ex, two ex jockeys or usually two ex jockeys will be on the panel as stipes and one um, steward and then a chairman. It is a very difficult job because if you go too far, um, it, I, I get it. We went too far, but I, I'm also worried about going too far the other way, where you know connections start to feel hard done by when they, they lose a race because they've won a bit like the one at Foss last on Saturday night. I know you haven't seen it, but the one that won three quarters of a length, three quarters of a length, quite a margin. I, I'd want a lot of interference to, to definitely say that I was going to turn around three quarters of a length. Uh, you know, in the last hundred yards. Lads out at Liverpool and things like. That. Oh, that that was crap. Yeah, crap decision there. Uh, entry. Um, so, so the, the, this is the problem, and I, I, I think that's where you can also lose confidence with the with the betting public. Anyway, move on to um, uh, final topic. Uh, one of my favourites, doping. Um, mm. We love doping in racing. It's fantastic. They're all at it. They're all, all of them. All at, yes, all, yes. They're all bent. Yeah, so it is. It is, and, and and I'm referring back to to this this case that seems to have been uh, not reported on at all, 
by the British media. No, at all. Nothing. You don't see anything of it. You, they might have commented on it once. You might have seen a Racing Post article. or I think I asked Lydia, to, Lydia Islock to investigate. She never did. But anyway, Seth, Seth Fishman, Dr. Seth Fishman, was busted in 2020. And uh, in 2022, he was ordered to serve 20 years in prison for the super drug, which was avoiding detection. These drugs were increasing red blood cells and significantly increasing endurance. Uh, Fishman specifically targeted clients uh, globally in the racehorse industry. And I I repeat the words globally. These drugs have ended up in in the UAE, Australia, Ireland, France, GB. Um, It's interesting. Um, you know, the, 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 this just does seems it's a bit of a carpet job. And so, Stuart, you, you're a trainer. I mean, do you think you can get to the very top in this game without some extra help through medication? Well, obviously, you know, they've got a problem in America. Yeah. And, you know, that's obviously surfacing. They've had, they've had problems in Australia as well. And recently you've seen a few cases in um France for different types of thing. Um, it would be naive to think that, you know, it, it wasn't happening at, at, at some level everywhere. Yeah. You know, you'd, you'd have to be very naive. Um, I can only speak as I, as I find, and I've, to be honest, I've never seen or heard anyone with, with anything that can make a horse run faster, but it's not—it's not something that you talk about, though, is it? It's not something. That... But you, you know, it isn't. But you can. <laughs> if you, if you, if you... In Newmarket, it's like if it, it's one of them sort of things where if if someone falls off and breaks their arm on one side of town, by the time oh, yeah. it gets to the other side of town, they're dead. Yeah, I get that. It's yeah. that kind of place, and <laughs> you know, it it you'd have a job to keep anything quiet in Newmarket. Um, but like I said, how did, Zeru- how did Zeruni keep it quiet then with his with his seven seven million needles? Yeah, that's a different. <laughs> you know, that, that's a very private operation up there. Yeah, uh, but I think you know, I think one way of of tackling anything like this is more out of competition testing. Um, I think one of the, the the rules that could be tightened up straight away is that. I can run a horse um, after it's been in the yard for 14 days and run it under my name. Yeah. So, you know, I haven't trained that horse. If it's only been with me for 14 days, yeah. I haven't trained it. I haven't conditioned it. I haven't done anything, really. I've got it for 14 days. I might have galloped it twice. Yeah. Now, the, the um, pre-training yards are not licensed. The BHA have got no jurisdiction over them at all. And they can't. They, so the BHA could walk into my yard tomorrow morning and do an inspection and take bloods and take swabs and, you know, look in my medical record book and look in the medical cabinet and stuff like that and find whatever we use. They can take away and analyse and it's all above board. And, you know, they sometimes do. They can't with the pre-training yards. That's in here and Obviously, they've got no jurisdiction about what happens in Ireland. And I would no. say there's probably more pre-training yards in Ireland than there is here. <laughs> um, so I would I would I would make that at least a month, if not probably two. That, you know, if you had a horse in your care, you'd want to know what's what it's been having, what it's been eating and stuff like that sort of thing before you send it to the races. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, maybe you would, depending on the uh, the deal you've got with the new owners. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I mean, the thing is, I mean, you, you look at Royal Ascot, and their, their poster boy is <coughs> Wesley Ward. Um, Wesley oh, Ward right. has a has a total list of forty three drug offences, and yeah, including okay. recently, he got a thirty day ban and and a five hundred dollar fine recently for using a. Um, uh, a prohibited substance, and um, so it's fun- Wagner, isn't it? <laughs> well, well, I, I was hoping to ask to ask punters and everybody the the, the king stand at Royal Ascot. Uh, who's going to put more in? Uh, is it Wesley Ward uh, of Golden Pal, or is it Edo McGuinness and a case of you? Oh. <laughs> who's getting the more super unleaded? Send them all to Bob Baffert. I, I say <laughs> you're all down on him. He looks well. Back. 
<laughs> well, it's, it's, it's interesting that Coolmore are now having horses trained by Bob Baffert. He's you know, all right, it's Bob. He looks you know, good. He's, he's if I looked that. that good when I was his age, I tell you what, uh, he's all right, Bob. Yeah, it's good, 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 horrible good. Bob. He's on his own stuff. <laughs> yeah. he's 200 years old you do know that yeah yeah i, I mean i mean it's I, my own personal view is that i i think if trainers can get around the rules they, they will do i i genuinely believe that because obviously yeah. i'm not a trainer I, I, I can bear i've had one riding lesson in my life and fell off so uh, i i can say as an outsider if i could obtain an advantage yeah um, by blurring the lines. I'm not saying you've been completely illegal. I'd do it. I really well, would. You know, if I was a trainer and, and someone showed me some medication or, or some, you know, that, that, that helped the horses, blah, 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 it yeah. wasn't harmful to the horses and no. it would it would improve performance and it was not on the list. Yes, of, correct. Of, not you're illegal. going to use it. Yeah. Of course you are. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a fact. Um, yeah, absolutely right. That's an advantage because it's, you know, it's a high pressure sport, you know, victory and defeat are millimetres away. Yeah. Give me yeah. some of that stuff. And, and basically, you, I you think either. That's despicable, uh, uh, <laughs> you're saying that. I mean, obviously, the, the, the correct thing to do is take the stuff, wait a year, get everybody thinking you're shit, and then you get good prices when you get do them down that. the handicap. <laughs> yeah, run them, run them, run, run them down the bank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, or, or, but... or send them to trainers that have never had a winner in five years. How about well, that? Uh, that, that? That's that's that. Yeah, that's recently been tried. Well, it has been tried for a while. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's been a few doing that. Um, yeah. One thing I will say, um, just so I think what people do get confused with sometimes is that. The press also get confused with this as well, is there are things that are licensed for ho the horses in racing, things that are licensed for horses, and also things that are not licensed for horses that are perfectly legal and above board. Yeah. An example would be pseudo cream that you get at the chemist. Yeah. Every yard in the country would have pseudo cream because it's good for cuts and bruises, the same as it is for people. Yeah. But they don't license pseudo cream in for racehorses because it's not worth it for them, the company. It costs a lot of money to license products for racehorses. If the BHA turned up and did a search of my medical room, they would find um, a pseudo cream in there that's an unlicensed product. And now the press would get hold of that and say, oh, they found an unlicensed product in Stuart Williams' medical room. And everyone thinks, Oh, he's doping the horses. Yeah, and it's yeah. not the same thing. So yeah. I think Good sometimes point. you get, you know, there will be, and and a lot of a lot of those products um, would be kind of some of them are veterinary products that are, that the vet uses on a regular basis that are totally legal to use, but they're not licensed in racehorses, and they just oh. don't have a have a license to use them. But they're not on the banned list. They're not against any rules or anything they're not against any bha rules they're not on the banned list but they're not licensed for racehorses and it's a, a kind of a blurring of the when you say it's not licensed for racehorses you think oh that must be illegal it must be yeah. against the rules yeah it's good not point. it's a you know a good point no yeah. it's, it's fair, fair enough no, because so it's, it's been Stuart. This has been a fantastic show. It's been yeah, an absolute definitely. pleasure to have you on, and and so, some of your uh, comments, and also you know some some things that I I I haven't known, and um, uh, what you, what you've said has been been awesome. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you on the sermon. Yeah, thank uh, you. We have certainly run out of time. Um, just a quick reminder that we are back on Thursday for the Derby and Oaks show. Um, around 7:38 p.m. Uh, that evening, um, uh, covering the two days uh, for the for the derby meeting. So make sure you join us then. Uh, hopefully, we shall line your pockets with silver. But once it, <laughs> it's, it's a difficult job of late. Yes, I, I know I'm out of form. Yes. Sweet papers. Yeah, yes, yes. Sweet papers. Yes. Anyway, so, so that's bye from me, John, Chris, and Stuart. Bye for now. Right, the show's over, boys. Thank you very much.